I do feel honored and privileged to be able to talk to you today and to have been asked to really provide some keynote closing comments to the conference. Um, but I think first you'd all agree that um, the team here, Greg, John, Lizette, Sam, all the teams that work with them, they've just done an outstanding job of pulling together the whole conference, um, having some outstanding speakers, and I think some very interesting content. So how about a big round of applause for them? So um, my prepared comments, uh, I don't have any charts. I don't want to bore you with graphs and squiggly lines that you probably can't see. Um, in wrap-up to this, though, I think my prepared comments, I hope, will resonate with you. Um, I think they're very relevant in the form that uh, they happen to coincide very much so and touch on a lot of the content that we've dealt with over the last couple of days. Um, and while that content has been focused more on the here and now, which I think is completely appropriate, and we need to be looking at where we're going with Central and Eastern Europe, um, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to take us a little bit back in time and try to really hit on some simple themes. I've worked in Central Europe for over 20 years, and what we saw in its evolution were some very simple themes that continued to evolve over time, talk about how they've evolved, and then really wrap it up with some comments on where do we need to go from here? What are the challenges, and where do we need to make the investment, and where does the focus have to be? So what I have is uh, four very simple themes uh, that dominated the early stages of Central and Eastern Europe's uh, overall um, uh, real estate markets. Um, the first theme was build it and they will come. Sounds very simple. It's like the field of dreams. And I think that um, it was defined by a period where there was absolutely uh, a lack of space, and the thesis was that new modern space would create its own demand. Um, the first time I came to the region was in 1996. The high-rise skyline consisted of the Palace of Culture, Finn Center, and Lim Center, which most people think of as the Marriott Hotel. That was it. And so last night we all sat out on the 46th floor of the Spire, and I think you look around and you see, I mean, just a staggering change. Looking at a city that soon is going to have over 5 million square meters of space, and, and the journey that we've all been through during that time period. What a, what a major transformation and a major accomplishment for everybody that's been part of that. Um, in 1996, we were working on the development of the Warsaw fin Financial Center. And forget about just the trick of actually doing the development and all of the scrutiny that the high-rise development projects were under at that time, and it was all very new to the authorities, to the community, et cetera. I'm just going to focus on the supply and demand com component. Um, the tenants that we were attracting, they were top-tier international law firms, consultancy firms, banks. And the amazing thing is that they were all here, for the most part, but they were in walk-up buildings. So this was really the, the, the pioneering days. Um, the overall stock of Class A office space was under 100,000 square meters. As I just said, we're going to push over 5 million square meters, I think, in the next year. In the retail sector, trading was occurring primarily in street markets or bazaars, um, along with some limited high street retail locations. And the first wave of really retail shopping center development was driven by the hypermarket operators. That's who were driving it. They were controlling the land sites. Um, they were very good at selecting locations. They were principally focused on getting the hypermarket op open and selling product. Um, so there was a lot of work to be done as it related to the retail gallery, and that took us into a stage where we went first generation, second generation, third generation, even fourth generation shopping centers, with the fourth generation maybe being even a bit too large for what the city or the, the catchment area was. So build it and they come, build it and they will come, I think worked very well in the early years. There was a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, we made some mistakes along the way, there were some excesses, but I think overall um, we reasonably brought more sophisticated consideration to the table and the fundamentals to bear. Basic things like location really does matter. Infrastructure and transportation that we've talked a lot about over the last couple of days. And amenities, they do matter. Efficiency and space utilization, it does matter. With incomes and consumption increasing, retail consumers wanted more than just the basic needs of what the hypermarkets were providing. And you heard the two panels ago, the group talking about the fact that the hypermarkets are having to adapt and shift. Well, the retail shopping center has adapted and shifted. 
the third and fourth generation centers are much more catering to the needs of the consumer that they want fashion, they want entertainment, they want leisure, they want an experience, notwithstanding all the pressures that are coming from uh, e-commerce and the things that have been talked about. So, so yes, we were building and they were coming, um, but it was to an ever increasingly sophisticated product and that product was largely being shaped by the tenants. Okay, so we were trying to meet somewhere in between. So that's the first theme. Second theme, um, large-scale convergence play. That's what we all were looking at for Central and Eastern Europe. This theme was driven by a broadly held view that Central and Eastern Europe was going to converge to standards in almost all regards to those of Western Europe. Income and GDP per capita, standards of doing business, transportation, or excuse me, um, transparency, lack of corruption, legal systems, and very importantly to the people in this room, a convergence of real estate yields. So from 2000 to 2008, this, is, this may have been the dominant um, driver on investment and growth. The structural change in going from uh, a communist-based society to capitalism was playing out and the economy was transforming itself from agricultural and manufacturing to more of an information and service-based economy. In 1999, we had NATO accession and there was a view EU accession was gonna come right behind that. And I think that one of the other catalysts that some people forget about was, this is just post the Soviet Union breakup. And so a lot of the businesses were trying to get to 300 million consumers that weren't just here in Central Europe, but went all the way into Russia. And Central Europe was viewed as a safe haven to be able to set up to do business. Ease of doing business was you know, a positive comfort level. Um, and I think that was one of the things that was also driving um, this convergent in, in the economic growth that we experienced. So Poland experienced annual GDP growth of 5.5% from 2000, or from 1996 to 2000. I mean, that's significant. Income levels increased from $8,000, and this is all dollar-based, sorry, but dollars, on a per capita basis in 1996 to 23,000 in 2013. And that's adjusted uh, for the cost of living increases. So and to sprinkle just a little more data in here to see, to see what's going into the cocktail of everything that was happening, uh, Poland was awarded 68 billion of structural and cohesion funds. So we talked about some of the EU grants. That was for 2007 to 2013. And then right after that, for 2014 to 2020, they were allocated a further 78 billion. And on top of all of that, the level of foreign direct investment increased to the level where the Czech Republic and Poland received over 100 million euros each over the last 10 years. So massive amount of capital coming in. And what did all that do to real estate products, real estate pricing? Well, the development followed. Um, the pricing, initially projects were being built on yields on cost of 15 to 20%, if you can believe that or not. I, I saw that. We were buying stabilized product in the late 90s, high quality product with high quality tenants for double digit yields. And the markets, they were thinly capitalized at the time and there were definitely different risks, but I would tell you that on a risk adjusted basis, we felt that it was very attractive and obviously many others did as well. So overall on the second theme, I think we got that right. There was clearly a major convergence um, uh, play that was there uh, and rightfully so um, for all of the reasons that people I think well, well understand. But I always look at it and say, we took that maybe just a step too far. And we got to a point where, that I call the emergence of a homogeneous yield. So somewhere in 2006 or 2007, I think, we'd be talking and we'd say, well, you know, what's the yield for this property or for, for this particular investment? And it, the answer was always the same. Well, it's gotta be six or six something, right? And it didn't matter if it was in Warsaw, if it was in Prague, or if it was in Bucharest at that point in time. That's just a fact. If you go back and look at the history, that's where things were trading, and it didn't matter if it was office or retail. The yield was the same. It makes no sense. The yield premium to Western Europe went below 50 basis points, the way that we looked at it. And I remember having conversations with really sophisticated, serious investors that were saying, should be less, could be zero, because of all the growth pr prospects of Central and Eastern Europe. Well, GFC came through. We got taught a very old but a very serious lesson about the depth of liquidity and how much that matters in any kind of m marketplace. And while the CE markets today, they're much deeper, they're still what, somewhat capital constrained. So we saw this wave of capital come in, and then today we have some constraining factors that I'll talk about a little bit in the next theme. So that's the second theme, the, the whole convergence play and, and how that worked out. The third, 
Um, was improving politics and transparency were viewed as really a one-way bet. It was all going to go in our favor. You know, governments were playing nice, nice with Brussels. They were all looking to, for the Holy Grail, which was viewed as EU accession at that point in time. With that would come EU harmonization. There'd be reduce, re, a reduction in country risk. There'd be reduction in legal risk, tax harmonization. Um, even currency was talked about, even though we as real estate people have had the benefit of hard currency leases here forever. There were dollar leases here in Poland originally. And then it was, you know, Deutschmarks in Prague. And everyone was saying, don't worry, it's going to go to Euro. The, the, the Poland and Czech Republic and Hungary, by 2005, 2007, it'll be Eurozone. So um, uh, the, the other things I think that we were confronted with were all going away as well. Um, rely, a reliable land registry. We'll get rid of all those pesky re, um, uh, restitution claims or we'll get title insurance to title around it. And if we were wrong about all of that, the double digit returns that I mentioned would get us out in five or six years on a leverage basis. So we had that backstop um, that we were mindful of. But I would tell you that in our investment committees, um, the number one risk that we talked about at that point in time was liquidity. Who was gonna take us out? And I think that we've all seen, and fortunately, there's been a wash of capital. There was debt, there was equity capital introduced in the form of opportunity funds, regionally focused private equity funds, public companies, Austrian investors, German investors, Asian investors. So there, there has been obviously serious interest in the core of Central and Eastern Europe. And I mentioned before that the Central and Eastern European markets are much deeper today. There remains this broad base of investors um, that are investing and I think are going to continue to invest. But one of the things that I think is a conundrum is eight years after the GFC, what we've seen is a constraint of capital in the secondary or B-class buildings. And how do you price that? And who are going to be the permanent owners of those properties? And that's still trying to work its way out. And, and it's something I think that hopefully will be solved. But I think it goes into the uncertainty bucket as far as other concerns in the, in the world. And you have all these investors, though, that clearly want prime core properties in you know, Poland, Warsaw, all the other cities that were mentioned, Prague, and now also Budapest, I think are becoming more and more interesting to, to institutional capital. So that was the third theme. Um, uh, the one-way bet on, on the, the emerging government and political environment. And so the fourth theme was Russia, Ukraine, the Baltics, and southeastern Europe. They're just like Poland and the Czech Republic, only a few years behind. And so yields were converging fast, and I think that's the logical thing, right? We say, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to go further in the direction west. The yields were lower. We're going to go east. And so I had to put in you know, one theme that we got way wrong or for the most part wrong, because those markets are clearly different. As has been talked about over the last couple of days, the politics are different. In some places, the rule of law is different, and the pricing should accordingly be different. And as real estate investors, or if you're a financier, or you're a developer, or an operator here, I think no matter what we're doing, the number one thing we have to do is be able to evaluate risk. Um, and I think that this, my timeline that I'm going to was more of the 2005 to 2007, and I think that, you know, that concept that Russia and the Ukraine, Baltics, Southeastern Europe, it's all the same. It was in the homogeneous yield comment that I made earlier as well. And all markets are not created equally, and, and we've learned that. So to be maybe a little bit provocative, I guess I'd say, we went from an emerging market story on the doorstep of Europe that has all this growth potential to where we are today, which I think some people have looked at and said, look, it's a small region in Europe, it's a little bit different, and it's suffering from a bit of an identity crisis. And I say that with all due respect because I spent a significant amount of my career participating in the market here, and I honestly know and believe that CEE has so much to offer. Very strong technical schools, as a result, highly educated workforce, cost-effective place to do business, still has outsized growth prospects, as I mentioned. As one example, because of all that, CE has become, and this has just been talked about on the last panel and before, uh, a significant uh, leader in BPO and outsourcing locations. And by the way, that's gone past this low-cost provider 
on call centers and things of that nature and is expanding into much higher value added outsourcing. So all of that's going to continue to increase demand for real estate products. And the question is, you know, how do we meet that demand? How do we stay in front of it? How do we build the right environment? So those were the four themes, and, and I'm, I'm really, in the interest of time, um, I had you know, three things that I wanted to focus on, but I'll, I'll really focus on two of them. And they're really driven around how do we get to the next phase of CEE's evolution. The fact is, it's going to be hard work. The easy money's been made. That's the bad news. It'll require a significant investment of time and resources, not only from the private sector, but most definitely from the public sector. But I think if we get it right, um, it'll be critical uh, to make the urban centers in CE truly sustainable throughout the 21st century and beyond. And I think that's really what ULI and what the last two days has been focusing on. And so I'll, I'll apologize in advance because these are a little esoteric, but they are critically important. Um, the first is improving the master planning process, and the second is dealing with the declining de demographics that Central and Eastern Europe has inherently in, um, in, its, in its fabric. Um, the improvement of the master planning process, I've heard people argue it's not the government's job or role to be commercial. And, and I got to say, um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I do. But I also believe that governments are inherently set up to administer the public's well-being. And I don't know what could be more important than setting up a dependable framework that directly translates into people's quality of life, their ability to have a better blend of work and life balance, enjoy good transportation, good education, good cultural, retail, and commercial options that results in a community that's being desirable. I mean, I think that's pretty basic, and I think that there has to be framework and guide rails um, that provide that comfort not only to the community, but for also the, to the commercial participants that want to develop and operate in, in that environment. And if successful, I mean, it's really a win-win because it translates into people, quite simply, not just wanting to work there, but wanting to live there. And it sets the stage for higher employment, stronger economies, and ultimately, better tax revenues for the government. So I thought Tom Murphy's comments yesterday were incredibly powerful when he said, talent matters and talent will choose where they want to live and where they want to work. It's just basic. And, and, and that's going to become more and more an element of things that we've got to take into account. There's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. And if you don't get that basic rule, I think you're in trouble. So I, I think the governments have to, to participate this, and I think the private sector does as well. If they want to continue to enjoy the trajectory that Central and Eastern Europe has been going through, it's going to have to be different going forward. And that's going to take really this master planning function. But it also goes beyond that. I think that CEE needs to really start thinking about public and private partnerships. I think you've got to get the engagement on both sides of the aisle. Quality of life issues need to be prioritized. Social impact and mixed use excuse me, considerations they just need to feature higher on the agenda. It's just a fact. Um, so there's been significant infrastructure investments that have occurred. We talked about the EU grants that have been given. I love Lezik's comment about uh, Bitgosh. I've been to Bitgosh, great city. We need to keep putting the infrastructure into some of these important decentralized cities, but also go beyond just road, roadways and airports. Okay, so there's gonna have to be more commitment to that infrastructure, because that's what's gonna harmonize the whole environment that people are living in and, and people wanting to be here. Um, so the second point was about just the fact Central European has poor demographics, aging population, and declining birth rates. Fine. In part, we need people and population growth to fuel a productive and, and an increasingly efficient economy. So two very important points, and again, it's as if all the presentations, I knew what they were generally going to cover, but I had no idea about the content. They've been covered in detail, but they are hugely important. Urbanization, and in some places it's called reurbanization, and immigration. Those are the two things we've got to think about here very carefully. It goes back to the point about talent. Talent's going to choose where they want to live. It's a combination of living standards, commutability, amenities, the cultural experience, all of that has to be wrapped together. So the structural changes and the shifts in the economic drivers means we'll continue to see concentration of people in attractive urban environments. And this may come at the expense to some rural, 
cities, and I'll use Poland as an example, but it may, I think, be very promising for major cities to just pick three, Warsaw, Krakow, uh, Wroclaw. We, I could go down a list, I don't want to leave any of them out, but I think they're all very desirable for different reasons and they should continue to see this population growth. Urbanization, it's not a theme, it's not, it's not a kind of a passing element. It's going to continue to be very important, I think, for Central and Eastern Europe, and it's going to be important globally. Um, and then finally, on, on immigration, um, I mean, what a hairy topic, right? I mean, an interesting challenge um, for everybody uh, throughout Europe, um, but really what an opportunity to just be a little bit glass half full at the same time. I mean, Central Europe needs to find a way to have an intelligent immigration plan. And one that, if it's managed correctly, could bring in productive and skilled laborers in, in, into this market and, and facilitate greater growth. So I, I appreciate that one's easier said than done. And I don't mean to bring it up and run away from it, but we could spend you know, hours talking about it. I frankly don't know what the solutions are, um, but I know that the people in this room need to be part of finding the solutions, um, and it needs to be a, a significant um, focus. So what's the point? I think you know, there's, there's challenges there, there's solutions. Um, there's great minds at work in this area of the world. Um, I think Central Europe has come a long way in a short period of time, and now's the time where we really have to invest in the future. And the last thing I'll pull in from the presentations and, and the uh, speeches over the last couple of days was Carl's comments about the city of New York, or Tom Murphy's inspirational speech about Pittsburgh. And as you maybe could tell, I'm American, although I've lived over here for almost 20 years, but I, I saw those situations. And what I can tell you is that they, all, they both had happy endings, but the medicine was really hard to take. And I think the point for us is, don't wait until the medicine's too hard to take. Central Europe is really still in a formation phase, and if we can get the public and the private side to get their act together and really make these investments, uh, I think the future is very bright for Central Europe. So with that, I'd like to thank you and um, look forward to the journey with you going forward.